All right, good morning and good afternoon and good evening wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the LJWL Creative Writing Celebration, which is our annual homecoming event. And we're so glad that we get to still do it this year while we're virtual. And in some ways it's even better because we get to have you join us um, from all over the place. So thank you for being here. I'm Dr. Katie Manning, and I am going to host us kind of lightly this morning. Um, mostly people will be introducing themselves before they read. So we're going to jump in um, pretty quickly. We have 21 readers this morning, but each person will be reading just one short piece. So it should be fast paced and fun. Um, and we're gonna have just a really good time listening to each other. So our first group of readers is a group of current students. Um, and these are students who the faculty nominated to read at this event. And we certainly have so many more students who could be reading. Um, we just have such a, a fantastic group of writers um, currently. So these are some of the writers who are doing some really exciting things right now, and we're excited to hear from them. So we're going to let Amari take it away. Hi, my name is Amari Burgo Santoyo, and I am a sophomore writing major. Awaiting invitation. A skeleton is a good sign as it rattles to your side. Roses in display cases of ice peep out from the base of the jaw, the ear cavities and one eye socket. Thorns of titanium mock the skin and split into caves of ivory. Vines twirling into the rib cage, velvet petals tickle bone. Tendons of green stems grow and creep as the skeleton leads you to the field, overcast, windy, solidifying, a different realm, but real nonetheless. The skeleton turns to you and echoes from within. Death is watching over you when you sleep. It has something to say. It wants to give you beauty and comfort, but like a ticking bomb, life tries to steal you away. To this, you take his hand, a thorn pouting in the palm. You meet it with your own palm, feel the prick, bite, and then warmth, as crimson starts to crawl across metacarpals. And take this offering as a sign that it has no other heart but mine, but to slip into death today would be to die yesterday. And since yesterday proved uneventful, life needs me to stay. And in the palm of the skeleton, the pouting thorn of blood wilts, decays, as the red slinks up, puffs itself into velvet petals of a new rose, not yet encased in ice. Amory, that was fantastic. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Jaden Goldfain. I am a sophomore writing major here at PLNU. Um, and the piece that I'll be reading today, I actually wrote about a year ago in Katie's poetry class. Um, and about a month ago, I was asked to revise it. And rewriting something that you wrote pre-pandemic is a wild experience, and I learned that firsthand. Um, and the context of it has definitely changed to reflect more of what we're going through today. Um, so that's a little bit of backstory about it. Um, just a fair warning, it's a little intense, it's a little honest, a little, little raw, but I've never been one to shy away from those things. So here we go. This is called The Quarantined War of the Young People. Every generation needs a war to make it great. Ours does not have guns. The blood river in the streets is not from bullet wounds. Hell, you can't even see it. Our enemy nestles himself closely in the lonely six feet caverns between us and our lifeline soul friends, in the one like on a suicide letter Instagram post, in the 704th hour of social, social isolation, he is there sowing vines of stifling solitude, insecurity, weariness. It's over these that we trip and fall heart first into nothingness. 
without a sound. Because the pain of a pixelated face cannot be tangible, so it must not be real. See, these monsters of shadows are wizards at convincing us that we have no monsters at all. Everyone is alone, therefore everyone must want to die. Our grievances aren't that special. And if we believe them, that the blades of self-destruction that rip through years and years of proudly constructed life, that they're just imaginary friends turn sour, that the whisper aches inside of us are a natural part of life, the shadows will become our souls as they bleed cries of emptiness. We are hollowed when we believe it is finished, was meant for our lives. See, this generation isn't fighting battles because they're too busy fighting themselves. Trust me, when Satan's lies have clogged your heart's receptors for love, when you haven't felt more than brittle in a week, Jesus doesn't feel like enough. This is war because God's children no longer feel human. Fellowship may you smother the loneliness in the cavities of our souls. Breath of Christ, may you undam our blood so we may rush in rivers rather than faucet trickles. War of the lion, rip the foam of fatigue from a generation's pulse. Saturate and shine our battle line with your vibrancy and may every child of God know. His hand rests love on your shoulder. In the Prince of Peace, you are alive today. Scream for Satan to get behind you and you run and you run. Don't you stop running and the father who loves you, you are alive today. Beloved in this war that seems so eternal, Jesus is more so. Yes, and absolutely you are alive. Thank you. Wow, Jane, that was fantastic. Great job. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Emma McCoy, and I'm a sophomore literature writing major. And today I'm going to be reading a sonnet that I wrote about the prophet Deborah. Now, Deborah is probably my favorite prophet because she is just such a spitfire. She's from the book of Judges, and she judged Israel before there were kings. Um, and so here is Unstoppable Force meet the immovable object. I'm a God-given mouthpiece, a prophet. They call me a judge. I can do that too. Watch the war-hungry men who would profit from God's wisdom falter in my newsroom. I was shocked. Call me a maybe quitter. When he came in, brawn bared and asked for me, I thought, what? You need a babysitter? God has not hidden me my mysteries. He lays them all in lines like graveyard rows. And so I see from the hills in visions, a woman with a bloody stake who knows a ground teeth promise and God's precision. Human pride and fear tend to intermix. I don't care for your death bound politics. Wow. Thank you, Emma. It was great hearing that piece again. She was part of the same class that I was in last semester, and I'm reading a poem from that class. My name is Maddie Bucci. I'm a senior Spanish and writing major. The poem I'm reading today is an erasure poem that I wrote, which means I took a passage of scripture from Judges 9, which is the death of Jezebel, and I used the passage as a word bank, and I just reworked the words and I retold the passage from Jezebel's voice or what I imagined her voice may have been like. This is called, This is Jezebel, which are the final words of that passage. This is Jezebel. When I hear about it, your plot to kill me, that is. I put on makeup and arrange my hair. I am a king's daughter and I will look like it when you bury this old body. I look out the window. You enter the gate, shoulders wound up with bow and arrow and prophecy. Throw her down, you call to the eunuchs behind me. They do it. Some servants, they are. 
So this is it. I die in a tomb of blood under horses as they pierce flesh, skull, feet, hands, heart. Who is on the side of this cursed woman? Surely not you or the word of the Lord. No one except the dogs who devour me. Thank you. I always love everything Maddie writes. I got to have her in my um, honors project class. All right, so this poem's a little bit different. It's something that I wrote while meeting my partner during COVID. So it's kind of got an interesting tone. It's called a fattening. You slip off my satin sadness and I learn how to be sweet, squishy and malleable, even as my muscles are stiffening I am molded into something new, into something that can accommodate you, my keeper, my compliment, my last tie to the land of the living. Everything with you is a fattening, a gaining, pound by pound, inch by inch, in spirit, heart, and presence, I become the biggest I have ever been. Thank you. I loved that so much. I am Sydney. I'm a senior writing major. And today I'm gonna do something a little different and a little out of my comfort zone. So I'm definitely most, most comfortable in the genre of poetry, but I've been dabbling in the essay world this past like six months. And so I'm gonna read the conclusion from an essay I started in Robbie's class last semester. So some of you may heard it but I'm kind of in the phase with this essay where I want to burn it <laughs> but I also like want to keep working on it because I know it has a lot of potential but I'm just like so over it but here's the conclusion it's also it's about surfing which is I think really hard to write about in a way that's like not super cliche so here we go surfing is a spiritual practice and this wave is church it's a sacred space frozen in prehistoric time. After a magical session of perfect waves, I often get out of the water and marinate in nature's magnificence on the beach for a few moments. I am a spectator of God's great show, watching the sun bleed and bend into the horizon. Caressed by the cove surrounding the perfect little patch of sand in which my toes bury into, I watch the colors strengthen saturating the horizon with tangerine-toned oranges and fiery fuchsias. Slowly, the intensity fades and colors begin to mute, making space for the blackness of night. The undeveloped moon hangs low behind me over the tall green and golden cliff, a faint glow illuminating its edges. The moon is not yet in its final form, nor the sun's reminiscence fully retired for the day. I am the space in between, I am a hundred million miles away from everything behind me and everything before. I am nothing, yet I am every grain of sand on the ocean's floor. That's it. I am following you up. Um, gonna be hard to top that one. That was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for reading that with all of us. Um, I'm reading uh, for my honors project. I'm writing um, a book of poetry about American history. So I will be covering World War I in this poem. It's called Over the Ramparts We Watched. We sold munitions to Britain when World War I broke out. Brokered loans to both sides, but ultimately sided with the allies. Henry Johnson was a member of the all black National Guard, a regiment known as the Harlem Hellfighters. They spent 191 days in combat, more than any other American unit. Early in the war, the men dealt with prejudice from fellow soldiers until the government sent them to work alongside the French. In May of 1918, Johnson served on sentry duty at the edge of the Argonne Forest with Needham Roberts when the two were attacked by German snipers. Grenades and gunfire rained all around until Roberts was taken down, so Johnson stood alone. 
Seriously wounded, he wielded a knife and continued to fight until the enemy retreated. Returning from the war and marred by injuries, he was forgotten by his country and left destitute until Johnson died at 32. He was recognized by France's highest military decoration during his life, but would not garner the rightfully earned Medal of Honor until 2015. Oh, that was awesome, Micah. I loved it. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Noah Segoria. I'm a senior writing major, and I'll be reading an excerpt from my essay, affectionately named Kubler-Ross Model in Epistolary Format. So for those who don't know, the Kubler-Ross Model is an idea that tries to organize grief in the five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So I took letters written to my grandfather or my Lolo after his death and tried to sequence them according to this model. Uh, I'll be reading three short letters, uh, one from denial, one from bargaining, and one from acceptance. Uh, Lolo, you died today. Dementia, right? To me, it was around 11 in the morning, but to you it was at nine in the morning. It was game day today. My first university homecoming game, actually. Mom told me to call her. She said you passed in your sleep early before the sun rose, that it was peaceful, quiet. I didn't think much of it, if I'm being honest. I knew it was coming. I'm just surprised you lasted so long. Mom put Lola on the phone, and I asked her how she felt and if I should fly home tonight. What a drag. In her selflessness, Lola told me that she'll be fine. She's looking forward to seeing me run the Baylor line on TV. I feel I should apologize to you. I had and have no intention of going home this weekend, and I was counting on Lola and rejecting my offer. I don't want to think about it too much. I'm not even sure why I'm writing to you. Obligation, I guess. Lolo. I remember the day before I left for Baylor. I had given you your lunch and sat on the chair next to you. You said you weren't hungry, that you were tired, and you wanted to sleep. When I got up to leave, you asked me to stay, and you pat the bed. Of course I obliged. You were my Lolo, after all. When I got up a few hours later, you grabbed my arm and asked me not to leave. I remember your hand, cold, wrinkled, bruised, thin, and weak. I told you I had to finish packing, but you just kept begging over and over. I'm not sure why you didn't recognize me. I remember gently easing your grip and tenderly removing your hand, telling you that I'd be back to visit. I wonder what things might have been like if I stayed, if things would be better. What if? I wish I would have stayed at least just a little while longer. I want you to know I despise myself for that moment and relive, relive it often. Uh, Lolo, my therapist told me to throw a rock into the ocean. I told him it sounds so incredibly stupid, but he said just to humor him. He said to write your name on it, to put all my anger, regrets, and sadness, and just launch it over the waves. Once I throw it, he told me, I'm not allowed to dwell on it anymore. Instead, I'm only allowed to focus on getting better. I'll let you know how it goes. Thank you. That was wonderful, Noah. Thank you so much. So our next batch of readers is a group of alumni, and we have alumni from the class of 2020 all the way to the class of 2000, <laughs> so, which in some ways seems like a short span, but that's a 20-year span. And we have alumni joining us from Florida and New York City and San Diego, and um, we're, we're spanning the country at least. So super excited to hear from our alumni. And we're going to jump right in with Toby. Hey, everyone. I'm Toby Franklin. A lot of you know me. Uh, I graduated in 2020. Best year. It's awesome. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm going to be reading uh, to you from this uh, short fiction piece. Um, it's an excerpt from I Am Not a Robot. Um, a lot of you might know what I'm talking about. Um, you'll see. Okay. 
Chloe signed into the job listing website, hopeful but tired of looking. On the digital form, she entered her name, her apartment address, although she hoped that would change as soon as she could get a job and afford something other than a small studio, and details of her job experience, despite it being thoroughly detailed in both her resume and her cover letter. There were several inquiries in a questionnaire asking about greatest strengths and weaknesses, which Chloe was certain that no one had ever answered fully truthfully if they really wanted the job. Chloe was in the process of double checking that she filled every text box when the web page timed out and refreshed the browser without warning. Her screen blinked white, her spinning cursor a harbinger of the purge to come, and then her last hour's efforts were no more, erased, other than a perfy, perky, uh, self-important pop-up notice that she'd spent too long on the same page there was no indication that the digital form had heard a word of what she'd spent the last 60 minutes explaining via type. As this was the third time this happened this week, she tossed over her desk chair and screamed as loudly as she could until her voice was thrashed and her downstairs neighbor thumped on the ceiling. She bent over the desk, now chairless, scrolling rapidly on her laptop touchpad, scouring the page for any scrap of information that could have carried over could have been saved. No, nothing, not even her name. Chloe even checked the clock to see if perhaps she traveled back in time an hour to when times were simpler, the form was yet to be completed and she was still hopeful about this application. But no, it was 10 p.m. as it was supposed to be. She was an hour wearier and had gotten nowhere. Snarling, Chloe scrolled to the bottom of the application and clicked on the I am not a robot test it was the only thing that her brain, which had ragefully regressed to the Neanderthalic, could handle. The I am not a robot examination proved to be the perfect cure for her seething, stressy state. Low quality photographs of suburban uh, cityscapes graced her computer screen, divided into simple grid patterns. Click on all the boxes that contain a stop sign, the test asked. She smiled giddily at the easily recognizable objects scattered throughout the simple jog jigsaw puzzle that was already put together. She wanted to take her time with this, to savor the simplicity of the shapes and colors test, so she made a little game out of it. She selected all the boxes that contained stop signs and then, feigning misunderstanding, selected different test. Ah, <sighs> crosswalks, click, click, click. Different test again. Now it's fire hydrants. Oh, this is like ecstasy, Chloe said hoarsely. The therapy of selecting little boxes containing little bits of American object that you ought to know as an, um, an adult driver was just so doable. It was comforting to know that regardless of all the failed tests and rejective applications that were behind her, she was at least capable to surpass this admittedly low threshold. Someone banging at Chloe's door broke Chloe from her trance. It must be Bradley from downstairs. Go away, Bradley, she screamed over her shoulder. I'll be quiet as long as our Wi-Fi behaves, she told herself. She turned back to her screen and gasped. Gone were the colorful quizzes that could entertain the fussiest of kindergartners. In their place was what seemed to be Latin characters and Arabic numerals, grained and extra deep fried, stretched and warbly to the point of only marginal recognizability. Type these letters, you scum, the form commanded. What? Chloe wondered aloud. Chloe scrolled her mouse over to the different test button. A pop-up in words as red as the words of Jesus commanded, you must answer this question. Screw that, Chloe, Chloe scoffed. Show me some traffic cones. She's hovered. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, I, I, I had fun with this, sorry. Um, uh, where was I? Uh, she hovered over and clicked different test. Answer the question, human. She resigned herself to take a glance at the characters on screen. The train wreck letters crashed over one another looking like mangled corpses. The first letter was definitely a G, or was it a nine? The second two letters both looked like a mix of an X or a K, and the fourth could have been a J, 
a W, although she could have been easily convinced that it was one of the vowels. Maybe all of them typed on top of each other. <sighs> Fun's over, she sighed. She closed the browser window and then her laptop. She walked to the kitchenette to grab a bottle of Prosecco when she heard a tiny, tinny voice. Hello? It asked. Chloe's eyes darted around the room, seeing no one, and then to the bottle. Still unopened. Chloe decided she wasn't yet drunk, but she, she would like to be. Hello? Chloe Mills of 6242 Glover Drive? Someone must be FaceTiming me, Chloe realized aloud. She patted down her hair and tore open the laptop. Instead of a balding, bearding hiring manager or a pantsuit wearing HR representative, what appeared in the video chat uh, window was a small metal person. Two tiny eye cameras looking into the screen, searching, questioning. Its face and body were plated in shiny green metal. Oh, wow, it muttered. The metal person's eye camera zoomed out quickly to make sure they were capturing everything correctly. A very advanced model, perhaps an automaton. H Hello? Chloe ventured. Whatever this was, it wasn't the impromptu job interview she was expecting. Hello there, it said. Are you like me? Chloe couldn't have answered if she knew what it was talking about. Sure, her tongue got heavy and sandpapery in her mouth. She reached for her water glass, wishing that she had been successful in her quest to obtain alcohol, never ceasing to lock into those metal eyes. The shiny green face cocked to one side as she glugged. What a fascinating bottle, it said. Who is your manufacturer? Hold on, Chloe was able to gag between sips. What's going on? Of course, the metal person straightened out in front of the webcam. Chloe couldn't be sure, but it seemed to puff out its chest a bit. I am E32, confirmer of I am not a robot tests in California, Arizona, and Texas. Uh, cool, Chloe ventured. Her head was throbbing as she tried to figure out what was going on. And you're video calling me? E32 shrunk down on camera. Chloe caught a glimpse behind the robot of a small empty studio apartment similar in size to hers. There was no furniture, no bed, no decor to speak of other than a plain white poster hung perfectly straight which read, humans stink. Most e-bots can handle only a few million people at a time, E32 said, circling back to what it thought were impressive credentials. But I, E32 straightened, and shifted in a squeaky office chair. Anyway, you failed the I am not a robot test, the test which I designed and monitor 17 times. Yeah, but I thought it was fun, Chloe piped up. Give me one more chance to do the test and I'll, oh, there's no need to pretend with me, it said in a tone that sounded smug. You do look awfully human, but it's my job to know the difference. The robot leaned in again. I just don't know where you found such an advanced body structure to upload your consciousness into. Maybe it was the alcohol withdrawal, maybe the boredom, maybe the existential exhaustion from the endless line of successful, unsuccessful job applications she'd been slogging through ever since graduating college, but she decided to play along. You've got me, she shrugged. I am a robot. What even is a traffic cone? Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Toby. Awesome, as always. <laughs> um, I'm Sophia Murkowski, class of 2020, um, and I'm going to read a poem. So it's called The Homecoming. Why are you special? My greens and blues and browns split the highways, suspending your restlessness. My pines and oaks whisper, dry skin silently splinter, but needles and leaves still sway to usher in the weary. Why do I return to you? I sing the song of quiet that you need to heal. Thanks. That was great. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah Morse. I graduated in 2019. So I'll be reading a poem uh, that I wrote during this pandemic. Uh, about my creative struggles during this time. It's called Castles Besieged. I once could retreat to the castles in my mind where dragons and gorgons and centaurs lounge with foxes and wolves and hippos 
in the company of royals and peasants alike, all waiting to be written into existence, all waiting to meet each other anew in the stories I cultivate, which can only be brought forth through my will to bring pencil to paper or fingers to keyboard. I once could summon these characters, could converse with these close friends of mine at the first sprinklings of steamy water or at Cinderella's curfew hour, but now silence. Bursts of creativity squashed by a giant, tinier, yet more formidable than Jack's. Gone are the days when voices argued over whether I should give in to imagination or to sleep, because now voices outside my head are drowning them out with anger and hurt and blame, and it is the pounding of my heart that I hear, rather than even the faintest whispers of character chatter. My fantastical friends are all trying to recover, like I am, from the crumbling of castle walls. And I'm left to wonder, will they be okay? Will I be okay if they are forced to find refuge in someone else's castles? Or when this is all over, will I be able to see the turrets peek through the clouds again to visit the fortress, unconquerable? Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. That was relatable and hits hard <laughs> with them. Um, with, with, will they be okay? <laughs> um, I have a, oh, hi. I'm Ellen Wong. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. I am a, an, an alum of 2018. And I am going to be reading a poem that is actually coming out pretty soon, I think on Valentine's Day, by a new magazine called Miniskirt Magazine. And the title of the poem is A Romantic Jesus. And a romantic is one word. So here we go. A Romantic Jesus. Never meant to show signs at a wedding. Always meant to save until later. But oh, how it made his mother smile when the clear water overflowed into rich red wine, when there was abundance a renewal of flowing fountains. It was there that celebration came to be. It was there between beloved creations, beloving each other, that he saw such love up close in real time. He was there drinking his fill, miracles no longer waiting. A romantic Jesus retreats from the, from the crowds, close to faith in solitude, refills his cup before greeting the fishermen, takes a shaky breath at the speed the crowds find him, hail him, press up against him, how fast they will befriend, and then how fast they will go. How fast the romance calls, the love the way things are, how fast he holds them, regards them, dear people, how quickly it all goes. Oh, to stop the rivers of time, the drink from emptying, to command stillness from the tempest and sleep in this boat, gently rocking. A romantic Jesus walks the straightforward path to the well sees the beautiful Samaritan woman he knew before she was woman born. How she stares with startled, skeptical eyes. How she puzzles over his proximity. How their voices soon exchange into bridges and gateways and the natural reaches of light, heavenly, organic light. Through her, he confirms, humans indeed have hope. Through her, he finds himself. Later, they gawk as if he'd forgotten the rules of their journeying. I have food you know nothing about, he says, not missing a beat. He never forgot the rules. They forgot the goodness. A romantic Jesus wonders, not regrets, but wonders. If he had chosen to come form into flesh that would respond into a body that felt the pull of the tide into sparking favorites, would he have more time then? Could he linger, cling to the earth longer with all the trivial hormonal distractions, loving one and then another, unfocused on the world, but he still loved the world and he still loved his kin, that here in the fields under the stars while foxes have their dens and birds their nest, he had nothing but his eternal love, nothing but his soul and the world and a cup not taken from him. A romantic Jesus looked at them and loved them, the late night whispering against midnight chill with questions of old, the earth smudged souls resting alive in flowering fields, their created splendor, the men who dared drop their nets to follow, the women who dared against all question to touch him, the wilderness, garden, and city as one. He breaks the bread, sobering. I have food you know nothing about, feeling the chill in his throat. This is my body, broken for you. He cannot himself heal. This is my blood, spilled, anticipates the solitude. 
take it. The piercing, tumultuous, passionate starvation of, remember me, love to come. This is my body. He tries to ground this moment, to nail it into the history of the world. Thank you. Per usual, Ellen, you were the queen, ruler, monarch, whatever, of just like adaption art of like fantasy, lore, whatever. I love it. Uh, I'm Lizzie. I graduated 2018 and I <laughs> texted Ellen last night because I wanted to read an excerpt from a novel and we both agreed I should read a poem instead. So that's what I'm doing. This is <coughs> a couple years old from a collection I printed out myself. Um, and it's called A Story, A Movie, A Song. Remember to say nothing is wrong. I'm in love with an idea that cannot breathe, a thought that will not leave. I fell for this dream without wings except little lines I placed upon the scene. I take a lot of care to treat you like you are separate from the idea in my head, a person not formed by hypothesis, experiment, conclusion, but by the stories you bless me in telling. You, who heard and let it be. You and I will always see that there is a freedom in this distance between you and me, a space between our syllables we leave for words to fill. The feelings that were not killed, the joy I still feel in an imagination unhindered by uncertainty. Love is a word to reclaim for the side of respect and decency, where friends can be more than some sort of destiny, a climax in a rom-com plot. Yes, a tightness behind a torn up fantasy cuts on my fingers, picking up the pieces, but a comfort in a repurposing. Wine into water, the overindulgence always matters. But I've moved us here for the side of survival and not a short-lived fantasy. I'm in love with you, but you are not with me. And though my fingers bleed, my heart hides safe behind this flesh screen. And that's it. Thanks, Lily. I'm Erin Rhodes. Um, I graduated in 2009, so it's been a while. Um, I, this is, a, I'm not good at writing short things. So this is the beginning of a fairy tale I wrote about six, and a half years ago I lived in Ohio. I'm in Florida now so way different climate and it's called uh, the ice deer. Sophie clenched the plastic stick of the perfect pinwheel in her fist. Her quick heavy breasts nudged the pinwheel's long tips into half spins. Sophie's mother sat on the couch with her honey hair draped over the back. Hope grew like a fruit in Sophie's chest and it hung in her ripe and ready. Sophie cautiously wove her fingers into her mom's thick waves. Her mom jumped and turned and her hair slid from Sophie's grasp. Want to brush my hair? Her mom asked lazily, but her eyes fell from her daughter and landed on the pinwheel. She jolted to her feet. Her hot cup of tea fell from her hand and splashed on her leg. The pinwheel's edges moved quicker. They pulsed with Sophie's breaths. I finally found the right one, Sophie whispered. It's a daisy. She turned around and fled down the hallway. Her hand found her dead sister's doorknob and she twisted it and plunged into the room. The pinwheel stuttered and shook as Sophie lifted it like a light in a dark place. Everything turned yellow. The lacy comforter lay peeled back to expose the bright buttery sheets. A band of wallpaper wrapped around the pale custard walls, and Sophie reached out until she felt the bumpy stucco firm under her hand. Her pinwheel, an undying flower, matched the wallpaper. Hundreds of daisies plastered around the room. The flowers on the wall looked like they spun, eternally twirling in the dead girl's room. It's perfect, Sophie gasped. Erin, can I pause you for her. a second? She scrambled sideways and landed against the bed. From under the comforter that was never washed. Erin. Sophie pulled out the photo she'd found a year ago in her mother's jewelry box. She held it against her Hi. face like a mask. See, Sophie said into the back of the photo. Her mom stilled and stared at Lucy. 
smiled at the camera with fistful of pinwheels. Yeah. So it's the it's being really choppy. So I was wondering, could you is my sound okay? There. So the can sound you is hear me okay. So could you mute your video, and then we could. Is my sound not working? It's being choppy, but the way that I fixed this in class before is if we mute the video, sometimes the sound will come through better. You want to try that? Okay. Let's see. Okay, um, how's that sound? I just turned my video off. Yeah, that, that, that makes better? it so much clearer. Yes, perfect. Yeah, do you okay. want to go I'll, uh, again? I'll, do you want me to start over? Um, yeah, go again. It was being- Just pick up where I left off. I, I would start again. Okay. It so choppy, it's um, hard to understand. Yeah. Just add. Uh, Cut me off again if you can't hear, but I'm not really sure what else to do if it's still choppy. <laughs> so, um, okay, sorry about that, everyone. I'll restart. Um, Sophie clenched the plastic stick of the perfect pinwheel in her fist. Her quick, heavy breaths nudged the pinwheel's long tips into half spins. Sophie's mother sat on the couch with her honey hair draped over the back. Hope grew like a fruit in Sophie's chest and it hung in her ripe and ready. Sophie cautiously wove her fingers into her mom's thick waist. Her mom jumped and turned and her hair slid from Sophie's grasp. Want to brush my hair? Her mom asked lazily, but her eyes fell from her daughter and landed on the pinwheel. She jolted to her feet. Her hot cup of tea fell from her hand and splashed on her leg. The pinwheel's edges moved quicker. They pulsed with Sophie's breasts. I finally found the right one, Sophie whispered. It's a daisy. She turned around and led down the hallway. Her hand found her dead sister's doorknob and she twisted it and plunged it into the room. The pinwheel stuttered and shook as Sophie lifted it like a light in a dark place. Everything turned yellow. The lace comforter lay peeled back to expose the bright buttery sheets. A band of wallpaper wrapped around the pale custard walls and Sophie reached out until she felt the bumpy stucco firm under her hand. Her pinwheel, an undying flower, matched the wallpaper, hundreds of daisies plastered around the room. The flowers on the wall looked like they spun, eternally twirling in the dead girl's room. It's perfect, Sophie gasped as her mom bent over her. She scrambled sideways and landed against the bed. From under the comfort that was never washed, Sophie pulled out the photo she'd found a year ago in her mother's jewel box. She held it against her face like a mask. See, Sophie said into the back of the photo. Her mom stilled and stared at Lucy, who smiled at the camera with her fists full of pinwheels. Sophie again thrust the pinwheel into the air. Her mom carefully removed the photo from Sophie's fingers and set it on the dresser. I can be just like her, Sophie said. You know you're not allowed in here, her mom said, and Sophie tried to run. Her mom caught her and turned to the hallway. You're not her, she shook into Sophie's face. But I can be, Sophie said. She stuck the pinwheel stick into the waist of her jeans. I can be. Never, her mom gasped, and Sophie felt the heavy ripe hope in her burst, and when it opened blood, it felt like fire. The heat rushed into her face and it was so hot she shoved her arms into her coat and bled outside into winter. A deer paused near the edge of the woods. He stood concealed by a tangle of naked trees. Dead branches snapped and tangled, dangled like wooden wind chimes. The deer's translucent skin, made of ice, chipped and cracked as he pushed through the broken trees. The branches reached and groped. They broke his skin and tore his hide. The deer lowered his head and shoved forward with antlers. A heavy crown top his skull. The antlers, bumpy from their tips, melting and refreezing, looked like grouped wax on long, slender candles. Though the trees clawed them, the antlers cut a path for the deer. His pupils slipped like puddles from branch to soft snow underfoot and settled on a small girl leaking heat. I'll stop there. Hello. Hi, I'm uh, Ron Lauterbach and uh, graduate of the class of 2000. 
and I'm enjoying listening to everyone read today. I wanted to recognize Dr. Blessing, who's here, as my last professor who is finally retired. So welcome to our retired world, Carol. Um, this is a poem about my father's last birthday. Dad's 97. Who's going to pay for all this, asks my father as he picks up a dripping foot-long hot dog. I watch a glob of mustard splatter on his jacket and tell him I am because it's his birthday. If I knew you have that kind of money, I would have ordered a steak, is his stock reply. My son sings, and many more, at the end of the birthday song. My father stares at the floor. After his favorite dessert of angel food cake and chocolate ice cream, I tell him I don't have enough money to pay the check. He handed me, he hands me the same $20 bill he's handed me for the last five years. The bill I will put back in his wallet at home after I sponge off the mustard and put him to bed. Thank you. Much. I, I love the, the blend of the humor with the, the very poignant. That was, that was really beautiful. Thank you. So our final group of readers is a group of faculty, both um, current and retired. And we will jump in with Robbie. Hello, y'all. Um, what an honor it is to uh, hear your words and read with you. Um, I'm an assistant professor of writing. This is my third year now at Point Loma. Um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my uh, book in progress about the City of David Archaeological Park in Jerusalem. Um, it's essentially ancient Jerusalem, so like where um, a lot of the biblical stories are uh, set. Um, and so I'm researching the archaeology um, this is about a page and a half. Um, I think the only thing you need to know is that there's a tunnel that goes under the ancient ruins of the city. Uh, this is called Walking the Tunnel of Siloam. Toward the end of my study abroad semester in Jerusalem, I walked the length of the Tunnel of Siloam, accompanied by several friends. Soon after Edward Robinson became the first Westerner to, to traverse the tunnel in 1836, Scholars pinned the tunnel's origin on King Hezekiah, who ruled Jerusalem in 700 BCE, thinking that Hezekiah built the tunnel as Sennacherib's Assyrian armies marched toward his city. Hezekiah's tunnel, as it's now colloquially known, carried water from the Gihon Spring, east of Jerusalem, city of David, underground, below the ancient city, to the Pool of Siloam on the western edge thought to have allowed Jerusalemites to drop buckets down a shaft to access water from the city walls when under siege. The tunnel stretches for 1,748 feet beneath 80 feet of dolomite limestone and slopes in a precise angle, so the tunnel elevation decreases precisely 12.5 inches from start to finish, allowing water to easily flow. The recent scholarship has pushed tunnel construction earlier than Hezekiah's reign, distancing it from the flashy siege narrative. Scholars still debate how the ancients constructed such a precise engineering feat so deep below ground. Today, the Siloam Tunnel remains unlit, channeling water from east to west beneath the remains of ancient Jerusalem. I didn't have a flashlight, so when a buddy suggested we use candlelight like the original explorers, I went along with the idea. It sounded cool. We arrived at the City of David National Park, a 10-minute walk from our university's campus atop Mount Zion, and descended a staircase to the tunnel entrance at the spring. The guy who'd planned the excursion pulled one single candle from his pocket, lit it, and headed within the tunnel. Nobody else had candles, and I found myself the last to enter. The stone ceiling starts at five feet low, so at six foot four, I hunched over and stepped into the tunnel flow. We'd all worn shorts because we'd heard the water level often reaches knee high, though at the beginning of the tunnel, the water only sloshed midway up my calves, 
submerging the camel leather sandals I purchased for 60 shekels the previous week. The tunnel walls soon narrowed to less than three feet wide. Furthest from the candle at the front of our group, I walked forward, enveloped in total darkness after the first 15 feet, only hearing the splashing of my friends and feeling the spring water rolling past my legs toward the pool at tunnel's end. With one hand, I brushed the cold, smooth stone wall on my left, raising my other hand before me at head level in case the ceiling lowered. For the entirety of the 30-minute tunnel hike, I hunched over, walking blind, my head just brushing the clammy stone ceiling above. My friends' chatting voices reverberated within the snaking corridor, enveloping me in a cacophony of discordant echoes. I slowed, then stopped, their voices growing distant, the splashing of their feet faint. Soon, it was me and the cool, damp air, the stone walls and stone floor and stone ceiling. I thought of the time, the thousands of years between me and the carving of this tunnel, sieges successful and failed, empires come and gone, around me, nothing but sheer, utter darkness. Unable to see the limestone walls mere inches from my eyes, I stood still in the deathly quiet, listening to the slight trickle of water flowing, water streaming, water pushing past just below my knees, in through the heart of the city of David and out the other side. Thanks. Thank you, Zoe. That was awesome. Um, my name is Margarita Pintado. Um, I am an associate professor uh, of Spanish um, and literature and culture. And I'm also a poet. Um, I don't have a title for this poem, which I wrote. It's about a class I taught in the fall, one of those remote uh, teaching scenarios. And I took some notes and finally last night and this morning I put it together as a poem. In Spanish one, students learn the grammatical phrase to be afraid. The last months have been so strange. 24 faces stare back at me. I take my time to study them. One of my children cries in the background. This is one of my favorite classes, the one about being afraid. But now that we float so intimately separate, I don't know how to read them. I don't know how to teach them about fear. I call them by name, one by one. I ask them, Anna, what are you afraid of? Anna says, spiders. I nod in approval. What about you, Carter? Carter says, heights. Leah is afraid of sharks. Anthony is frightened of getting sick. Consuelo fears losing her job. Matthew is afraid of always being alone. I pause. 24 faces stare back at me. I remember when this class was funny. I decide to incorporate another grammatical phrase to lighten the mood. To be hungry follows the same structure as to be afraid. What about you, Joe? What are you afraid of? I am afraid of becoming my father. 23 faces stare back at me while Joe looks down. I don't know what to say, so I follow my plan. I change my tone, put on a ridiculous smile and ask Joe, and when you are hungry, Joe, what do you like to eat? I really hope he doesn't say my father, and he doesn't. He actually gives me a big smile and answers, pizza. When I'm hungry, I like pizza. Well, I say, you're not alone, Joe. We all like pizza, right class? We are not alone. We all like pizza. 24 faces stare back at me. Suddenly, nobody is afraid. It's past noon and we are neither afraid nor feeling lonely. We are just so hungry. Thank you.
I have actual goosebumps all over that ending. Oh my gosh, that was really gorgeous. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I realized that I have not put myself on the program for the last few years that I've been hosting this, and it's my 15 year reunion this afternoon. So I am the next reader. I will put myself in the chat. Um, also, I wrote a poem for Dan Nelson. Dan is uh, the brother of Dean Nelson, and he passed away several years ago. He was a music professor at Point Loma, and he was especially known for leading the jazz band, which was amazing. But one semester, he was the choir director um, because we lost our choir director in the middle of the year, and he stepped in, and that was my freshman year. So for, <laughs> for one semester, the band guy was my choir director. Um, and I loved him very much. And so I wrote a poem for him. And the main event, this homecoming, is a film documentary of his experience of going through Parkinson and the last years of his life. So if you're, um, if you haven't heard of this, you should definitely look it up. And next Saturday at six, um, watch this documentary because it's going to be amazing. It's called Sometimes I Shake. And so my poem that I wrote over the past month is called Sometimes I Shake Too for Dan Nelson. A blast of brass, then drums vibrate the floor, the auditorium seats, the armrests, my hands. And I think of you, the band director who stepped in to conduct a college choir mid-year when we were left without a leader. You whose hands never stopped keeping their own time against your will. You who never let the shaking stop us from taking deep breaths unfolding trembling timbers to layer waves together in the air. You who could shift the quality of 60 tones just by opening one pulsing palm. You're still alive to me in choral hymns and jazz combos. Your body now a beat displaced, memory a syncopated sound. Thank you. Katie, that was wonderful. Thank you. I'm Bettina Tate-Peterson, Professor of Literature and Women's Studies. And I love this event. So thank you for including me again this year. Uh, this poem, uh, I started in December, right after a day spent entirely on Zoom. Uh, to go through my sister's clothes. She passed away in August of 2019, right before school started. And we didn't have time to gather to go through her clothes. And then the pandemic hit. And so we couldn't travel together um, for doing that task. So it got very much delayed. And we finally just had to try to gather who could and the rest, that would be me uh, participating on Zoom. So that's kind of the history uh, of this poem. I'm not sure it's finished yet, but here's what it is today. Going through her closet. I sat with you, nieces and sister, all day, a thousand miles away watching you through a Zoom screen, lift up each item of her wardrobe. A sacred task, it seemed, a ritual of absence. Her garments, now empty threads, pants and sweaters, jackets, most too big for me, but some modeled by nieces to gauge for size. Dresses and skirts, socks. She had so many. Perhaps an affordable splurge in a family of six. I'll take those, I said, to many pairs. My nieces unfolded and held close to the screen so I could see colors and design. Undergarments, 
sports bras and shorts, sweats and t-shirts, exercise gear from healthier days, scarves, one size fits all, which I could claim despite our different statures, hers and mine. Gloves, some had been mothers, artifacts of memory from the last time we women, aunts, sisters, nieces, daughters, did this task of sorting through a lifetime in clothing. Hats, she had already given me some as we culled together during one of my trips to see her. Cancer beanies, no one spoke up for those. Awful and precious ciphers. Give them to me, I said, niece handing them to sister to put into my pile. You, absent beloved, looked radiant in them in bald mockery of your killer. You could rock anything with your beauty. This ritual is exhausting. Freeing clothes from hangers and drawers, disbursing your wardrobe, your life now folded and given away. We broke for lunch to eat and talk of other things. Such ceremony requires sustenance. Then shoes in boxes on shelves, some worn, some new. Summer sandals, Sunday heels, flats, boots, and keds. So many different occasions for feet. Nylons, yes, she still had some of those, and trouser socks, empty purses and wallets, no forgotten cash in hiding. Robes, slippers, and pajamas, those final outfits. We saved her shirts for last, agreeing in unspoken consensus, they were most precious. Her everyday attire, vibrant with visions of her making art of food in the kitchen, of her homeschooling children into adolescents, into adults, of her at work in her garden saturated in sunlight or cricket song. Her shirts stored all those memories and more, draped on hangers in sacred silence. It almost felt heretical to lift them from their hangers, to scrutinize and sort. These are the necessary evils to close out a lifetime. We blessed her with our silence and our tears, closed eyes and buried noses in her clothes for scent of her, laughed at the handfuls of Kleenex shoved inside all her pockets, now at the ready for us. At every moment, dreading the finality we were affirming. At day's end, I asked my sister to show me the empty closet, now unpersoned, as if, as if naked hangers and bare shelves could make me believe in such absence.
Hello, everyone. Am, uh, I, I see Carol's face on the screen, not my face. <laughs> Go to um, the full, full view, and you should see the grid. Here, I'll, I'll mute myself again. No, I don't. I don't see me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can see you and hear you. Oh, okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Carl Windrow, Professor Emeritus of the old LJML department. I graduated from that department in uh, December 2017. Since then, I've been a missionary educator for the Global Church of the Nazarene in Eastern Europe, and I'm coming to you tonight from uh, Kiev, Ukraine, and I'm happy to be a part of all of this. I'm going to be reading a poem from a new book of poems that's coming out in two weeks. This is Shame of Self-Promotion. The title of the book is The Gospel According to Mary. It's coming out in two weeks. The poem I'm going to read is from the book. It's the very first poem in the book. All of the poems, including this one, feature the voice of Mary, the mother of Jesus. You're gonna be hearing my voice speaking, but in the poem, it's her voice. The title of the poem is Agni Dei. It is Latin for lambs of God. And in this poem, Mary is comparing Isaac about to be slain by his father with her son, Jesus, who's about to be slain by his father. And she's comparing the two of them. There's another Latin phrase in the poem. It's called Stabat Mater. It means the mother stands. And this is Mary's voice. Agni Dei. Isaac, without spot or blemish, about to be slain, lay there before him, trussed up in trust. His father's arm poised, the death angel hovering near, thoughts racing, fear of the known, and the unknown, but neither squirm nor blanch did I see in my son pinioned there. Nary a tremble in his lips while he looked upon me, his stabat mater. As to me, my son whispered his Job-like words, though he may kill me, yet will I trust him. Thanks everyone. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Windrill. I, I have admired your poems and depth of study on Mary for many years, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just recently retired this summer. Um, actually, I hadn't planned on it, uh, knowing I hadn't known ahead about the online teaching, but I'm <laughs> sort of glad I missed you know, uh -huh. on some of that after having done it for half a semester in the spring. But my thoughts are with my students who are still there and my, prof my uh, professor colleagues and so on. So um, anyway, I am enjoying a bit more time to write there. And um, this poem is a combination Valentine's Day poem and poem of place. And it's set in uh, the small town of Mechanicsburg, which is in Pennsylvania, just north of the Mason-Dixon line. So it was an important spot in the Civil War, that which comes up in a little bit here. And um, I lived there from age, uh, age nine to age 22. And it's where I first met when I was age nine, um, my current spouse and only spouse, George, and where I, where I married him and where I first lived. So the poem is called Ghosts of Mechanicsburg. And can you hear me okay? This is, a, I'm not sure if this, okay. The speaker in this is working, okay. So Ghosts of Mechanicsburg. Married too young, we could afford only a house too old. Renting the third story overlooking Main Street. We lacked its history. 
built before there was paving, before the railroad ran through, before the women's college was founded, before the Confederate occupation. A bit sadly it stood, wearing its 1849 facade, fading despite generations of paint, standing shoulder to shoulder with its aging companions in a shabby row. Yet we loved in the tiny bedroom and slant floored parlor, bathed in the claw footed tub and peered through the wavy glass windows with their cockeyed casements. Above the creaky attic, haunted no doubt with the lodgers of the past, kept us away all but once. We discovered an antique trunk with once regal curtain, once regal curtains for the now bare windows. But I bought a one yard, one dollar a yard gingham in bright colors and, and sewed window coverings for our private life to shield us from the street lights and prying gaze of the wanderers below. Inside, we painted the walls layered with yellowed wallpaper and sunned outside on the tar shingled roof through the bedroom window that door like opened to the fire escape, reminder of the house's aged peril. In winter, we stuffed windows and blankets in the drafty windows and wall cracks, cuddling for warmth. The attic ghosts looked down and blessed our union. A bat flew through the window, fitting for that haunted house. Sorry, a bat, bat through, flew through the kitchen, fitting for that haunted house. Recreating what we could in our image, the house still stubbornly remains. We left part of our young selves there to mingle with those who had lived before, whose passages were marked by war, prosperity and poverty, through births and deaths, love and the loss thereof. The past is memoria, reminding us of love and haunting the young who live there now. Thank you. Carol, that was beautiful. And I love that at the end of this homecoming event, the day before Valentine's Day, <laughs> you got us into the past and home and love. And that was just such a wonderful gathering of all of you. So thank, thank you. I wrote it for, I don't know if it's gonna be accepted, but there was a, a call for poetry that went out for Keystone poets to write about place in Pennsylvania. So oh, nice. we'll see if it gets accepted or not. Wonderful, fingers crossed for you. Thank you. Wonderful. So, in closing, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you again to all of the readers. I will give, I, I guess I could clap out loud because you can hear me. <laughs> I can also do my silent clap, but thank you all so much really for joining us. Um, this is just such a wonderful event and I look forward to it every time. So for those of you who are watching this later, thank you for viewing. Um, we hope to see you again next time. And I'm gonna stop the recording now. And for anyone who wants to, you're welcome to stick around for a little while afterward and we can just visit with each other.